Hello again, it's Dr. Greg Samways here to tell you some more about my Critical Thinking in Earth Sciences course. In this video, I'm going to go into some more detail about the content of each of the five chapters of the training program. So just remind ourselves, five chapters, the first one focusing on what is critical thinking. The second chapter will focus on the nature of cognitive biases in earth science. The third chapter will be focusing on debiasing strategies. How do we avoid cognitive biases? Chapter four, we'll look at the skills that we require to improve our critical thinking. And chapter five, we'll finish by looking at ways in which we can manage and develop our skills portfolio. So let's begin with chapter one. What is critical thinking? So critical thinking, uh, a definition here from Wikipedia, which I think works very well. The process of actively and skillfully conceptualizing, applying, analyzing, synthesizing, and evaluating information to reach an answer or conclusion. I think that pretty much sums up what we would all like to be doing. So that's what we are trying to achieve. What we have to consider then is what skills, what knowledge and what skills do we require to achieve it. So in order to practice those skills, we need to first understand what they are. But before we do that, we need to understand a little bit more about cognition. So what is cognition? So here's another, I think this is another Wikipedia definition. The mental action or process of acquiring knowledge and understanding through thought, experience and the senses. So that's cognition. And I think now it's been defined for us. Uh, we're not in too much, uh, we don't have too much problem understanding what cognition is. What you may not be familiar with is metacognition. Uh, and this I found very interesting indeed, the concept of metacognition, standing back and thinking about what cognition is. Thinking about thinking, knowing about knowing, being aware of your awareness. And I think that's certainly what I didn't do. I was just getting on with my job, thinking and solving the problems, but not thinking about how I was thinking or I didn't know how I knew things. I wasn't aware that I was aware of things that others were not. And it wasn't until I made that step into metacognition that I started to become aware of what other people were missing. And I think it's a process we all have to go through, is to step back and understand metacognition. But as we've mentioned, those cognitive processes are um, disrupted by cognitive biases and we're going to learn a lot more about cognitive biases. So let's have a, a closer look at what cognitive biases are. Where do they come from? Well you can actually uh, think of our brain as being divided into two ways of thinking, system one and system two. System one is the oldest part of the brain, it's the reptilian brain, it's the uh, amygdala. It's the part of the brain which we might call our fight or flight system. It's the ancient part of the brain which would uh, propel us to run away from danger when the tiger was attacking. It's a very primeval part of our thinking system and it's inclined to jump to conclusions and it's that part of the brain which takes the shortcuts, tries to save us time and energy. It takes shortcuts which lead us very often to making bad decisions. So that's systems one. It works very quickly, but it doesn't always work very well. The more recent development of the brain is the neocortex, the part which enables us to think rationally and systematically, to take into account all of the evidence and to use all of the evidence to come to a conclusion a true justified belief based on all of that evidence. And this is system two, but it takes longer. It's, it's, it's slower. So we think about system one as thinking fast, system two, thinking slow. System one helps us when we're in danger, but it really messes up our problem solving by inducing these cognitive biases. 
System two is what we should be doing as true critical thinkers. Now, this was recognised by Sir Arthur Conan Doyle more than 100 years ago. Uh, one of his friends and colleagues was a, a, do a doctor um, who needed to diagnose his patients, and he had a very systematic and logical way of going about uh, evaluating all of the symptoms, all of the evidence, and then uh, deducing uh, the, the diagnosis from that evidence. And Conan Doyle was really keen to incorporate these skills in a sort of superhero fictional character. But instead of coming up with a doctor, he chose a detective. And that's how Sherlock Holmes was born. Sherlock Holmes is the one who uses system two. He thinks slowly, rationally, logically, considering all of the evidence, eliminating all of the possibilities until whatever he is left with, however improbable, must be the answer. So that's Sherlock and his system two thinking. But just to square the circle, Conan Doyle introduced another character, Dr. Watson, and ironically, despite being a doctor, he actually very often employs his system one because he can't be bothered to think through all the evidence or doesn't have the capacity to consider all the evidence. So very often comes up with the wrong conclusions. And in fact, Holmes and Watson are used in schools of psychology to teach the difference between system one and system two thinking. So I, I recommend you uh, go back to uh, Sherlock Holmes and Dr. Watson and watch the box set again. And there's a great book that's been written by Maria Konnikova, which accompanies the box set, which explains all of the cognitive biases and how Sherlock Holmes is avoiding them. So this can be uh, some fun and an excuse to watch Holmes and Watson again. But what, what about these cognitive biases? What exactly do we mean? Well, uh, I mentioned in a previous video that there's nearly 200 of these, but here's just four to be uh, going on with to get us started. And one we're all familiar with, or we may not actually recognise the fact, is confirmation bias. And this is what so many people do, is looking for evidence to confirm their existing beliefs. And in so doing, ignoring all the other evidence. And just think of how many times you've seen this happen in, uh, in the workplace, uh, in life in general. Confirmation bias, that's one of the worst ones, plagues us all. Then we have anchoring bias, another interesting bias here. And this is effectively where somebody in the group makes a suggestion, provides an anchor to which everybody uh, attaches themselves. And then they go into uh, a process of confirmation bias, desperately trying to find evidence to uh, confirm what has been suggested. So somebody in a, a discussion can uh, anchor the whole group to a particular idea which will subconsciously direct them towards uh, a way of thinking. Availability bias is another very interesting bias, and it can, it can amount in a, a number of different ways. The, the obvious availability bias is just the idea which is foremost in your mind, and that could be because somebody has just thrown an idea into a discussion. You've been anchored so that's the only idea you can think of. It's an availability bias. You can't think of anything else. It's foremost in your mind. Alternatively, you, you might not have any other options available to, to you because you've only ever studied one depositional environment. So when somebody says, what kind of sediment is this? You say, oh, it's deep water. Why do you say that? Because you've only ever studied deep water and you can't think of anything else. There are no other options available to you. And we'll talk a lot about how important it is to be aware of all of the possibilities, not just the ones that you have learned, learned about. That's availability bias. Then there's another uh, major bias here, the framing bias. These are all linked, but framing bias is slightly different. It's where the same objective information can be framed in such a way that people are led to a certain conclusion. So the questioner is able to ask the question in such a way that those being asked will make the answer that they want. And a lot of people do this unconsciously, but I'm sure you're well aware 
of a lot of marketing people and politicians who use this all the time. And we'll see during the course that these cognitive biases are, are tangled up in the psychology of persuasion. So these are persuasion techniques. These are the sort of techniques that politicians and marketing people use all the time to convince you that black is white. But as scientists, we want to employ our logical argumentation, our reasoning, our scientific reasoning, and our, our rational thought processes and our systems thinking to solve problems using system two. We want to avoid these psychological persuasion techniques, and, and that's the challenge. But until we understand what they are, how do we avoid, it, avoid them? And that's what we'll be focusing on in chapter three, is debiasing strategies. Having understood the nature of cognitive biases in uh, general and the cognitive biases which specifically plague us in earth sciences, in chapter three we'll be looking at how we can avoid those biases. And there are two strategies, really two broad strategies. One is to modify the decision maker. So you and I as individuals, we make a conscious decision to think differently. We learn about cognitive biases and we learn to change our behaviours in such a way that we can avoid those biases. But this is actually quite difficult to do because it requires us to make a commitment and it requires us to, as individuals, make an effort. And that doesn't happen as often as we like. The alternative is to modify the environment and this is a much more successful approach and what we're doing with this is we're introducing systems which encourage decision makers to follow certain decision, ma decision making paths. This is so-called choice architecture. We're actually designing the environment in order to constrain or direct the choices. That sounds a bit ominous, but uh, in, the, in the right way, what we're doing is we're ensuring that everybody asks all of the appropriate questions at the appropriate time and considers all of the possibilities, not just the possibilities that are available to them. So those are the debiasing strategies, but they are difficult uh, to employ, uh, particularly the individual strategies, as I've mentioned. It requires motivation, which very often isn't always there in the individual. And in fact, the ones who suffer most from cognitive biases are the laziest thinkers who are in fact the ones who are least likely to be motivated to do something about it. So we are very much reliant upon modifying the environment upon the choice architecture. So we, in chapter three we'll be learning a lot about those debiasing strategies and learning about what does and doesn't work. And of course one of the aspects of that we will be talking about in terms of modifying the environment is to actually hand the decision making to artificial intelligence. So that I'm sure is going to spark a lot of interest in a lot of people. So we'll be talking a lot about the value of artificial intelligence in improving our decision making processes. Then having established the strategies we'll have learned something about the skills that we need and we've already spoken something about these skills in previous introductory videos but just to remind us we've categorized those skills into research learning knowledge management testing applying and communicating skills we need to learn more about those categories we need to describe each skill and in the course i'll be providing you with worked examples for you to follow and practice in order to get you started on this whole range of skills and we'll also have various activities in the course which will enable us to share our experience and not just learn from me. This is not intended to be a one-way process. I'm trying to create a, a community of practice here, a group of individuals who, who share a common desire to learn about these skills, to learn the skills, to share the skills and to pass on the skills. So a, a large part of the learning process will be you guys talking to each other, teaching each other. If you remember one of the best ways to learn is to teach and here's a great opportunity for you to teach people who demonstrably want to learn. They've signed up for the course, they want to learn and they will learn from anybody who is prepared to teach. So we get this circular process 
going on, this self-fulfilling process, hopefully in a community of practice where we all learn to learn, we all learn to teach, and we all teach to learn. So, developing those skills, we then need to think in Chapter 5 about managing those skills. So, what skills do you have? How many of those boxes can you tick? How competent are you at each of those skills? How do you measure competence? And once you've measured your competence, where are the gaps in your skills portfolio? And how do you fill those gaps? How do you expand your skill set? So I have an application called GeoSkills to help you do that. And when you sign up to the course, you'll get access to this application to enable you to assess and manage your skills portfolio. So here in a little more detail, we can see here, I'm going to just try and switch on a laser here, if I can remember how to do it. So laser pointer. What we'll see here is, here's one example of a skills portfolio, groups of skills. You click on any one of these and you see a listing of the skills. And then over here, we can see red boxes where we can choose, we can self-assess our competence levels. Uh, we also have the capacity for mentors to go in and uh, assess competences as well. This is a function we use within organizations and on training programs, not so relevant in this situation. Uh, but once you have uh, self-assessed, you can click on these individual competencies and it will give you a brief encyclopedic description of the competence just to remind you what it is. And over here on the bottom right, we see links to online learning resources. So that will link you to exercises, to wikis, to web pages, to, to any kind of resources that I've found that I think are, are useful for you to, to develop those skills. So you don't have to go finding those videos and those help me instructions. I've found a great many of them already. And of course, if you find some better ones, then let us know and we'll add them into the system. But how do you assess your competence? Well, what we've created is a, a uh, learning curve here. We can see eight levels on this competence curve from level zero at the bottom, which means you don't even know of the existence of the competence. But as soon as you turn on GeoSkills and take a look and read the description, you're immediately aware you're at level one. Once you've started following the links and reading the descriptions, you're then learning about that competence. You're up to level two already. Once you've got to a level where you can actually uh, pass some tests, do some quizzes and get the answers right, once you've developed the knowledge, you're knowledgeable, I call that level three. You're now able to have that intelligent discussion with a, a subject matter expert. You're able to ask the right kind of questions. And more importantly, you're able to understand the answers when you get them. So level three is very important. It doesn't necessarily mean that you are very well uh, qualified or capable to perform that skill. But what it does mean is that you can have a conversation with somebody about it who is performing that particular skill. Eventually then, when you can do it without supervision, you become capable. And then the learning really starts. This is when you start to practice. You don't do it once to prove your capability. You do it again and again. You apply it. You get to level five. You've applied it multiple times. You get better, faster, stronger. Isn't that a Radiohead lyric? I think it may be. Then we can go up through the scale to level six. You start to actually evaluate the process, the skill that you've learned and say, could that be improved? And you start suggesting and proposing improvements to the skill itself. Then you start publishing them, which takes you to level seven. And then you start publishing in peer reviewed journals, which takes you to level eight. So I think it's pretty clear what these levels are. And for each competence, you can assign your current level and you can strive to reach the, le the next level. And this is what we call leveling up in gamification circles. And uh, that's what we want to do. We want to level up to at least level four. And then we want to keep practicing to get to level five. So that's what we'll be doing in uh, chapter five. And you can see now to sort of bring it full circle, we'll be learning about Bloom's taxonomy of learning. And this is looking at the different cognitive levels of the learning process. And you'll recognize some of the words in here. 
these correspond broadly to those levels in the learning curve. So we start our education by remembering stuff. Hopefully we understand stuff, but we really need to be level five. We need to be applying stuff or analyzing or evaluating or at level eight, we need to be creative. We need to be imaginative. And it's ironic that our, our schooling is really focused down here at remembering things that you can regurgitate in an exam. We really need to be up here. And I don't think we're taught enough of this at school or at college. So it's up to us now to understand that those are the skills we need and to develop those skills. So we want to move from those lower levels. We want to get up to level five and we want to ultimately aim for level eight. So in summary, what I hope we'll achieve in this course is to improve our research and our accelerated learning abilities, gathering the knowledge, storing the knowledge, retrieving the knowledge. Then we want to improve our skills at uh, problem solving and analysis. We want to focus and enhance our problem solving skills. Then having understood that we need to reduce our bias and uncertainty in our decision making, understand those pitfalls and understand how we can reduce them through various debiasing strategies and improve our problem solving by re reducing the uncertainty in our problem solving eradicating that subjective uncertainty by avoiding the biases. And in doing so, hopefully, we acquire a whole bunch of new skills. We broaden those skill, that skill base. We develop those skills. Uh, we develop those superpowers. And in doing so, of course, the, the, the end point is to enhance your earth science CV. It comes full circle right back to what I said at the beginning. When I was an employer, I was looking for people who had critical thinking skills, people who could learn fast, who, who could apply that knowledge to the problem and avoid the cognitive biases using a variety of debiasing, debiasing strategies. And then having solved the problem, and reduced the uncertainty in their solutions as much as possible and understood the uncertainties, then being able to communicate all of that to your colleagues, your industry clients or politicians. That's the ultimate aim. That's what we're aiming to achieve. And that is ultimately what is going to make you more employable. So this is not just a course about critical thinking, about problem solving. It's about understanding how to develop the skills to become a better critical thinker and how to make sure that everybody knows that you have those skills and hopefully in doing so gets you that next job. Once again, thank you very much for listening. I hope I've given you enough now to whet your appetite and uh, to get you to, to sign up for the course. There's so much more that we can learn together. So I hope to see you enrolled soon. If you have any more queries, then don't hesitate to contact me by email on LinkedIn or via the geolumina.org website. So I've been Dr. Greg Samways talking about my critical thinking in earth sciences course. Thank you again for listening. And I hope to see you on the course. Bye bye for now.